Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual program on CCSRE, Planting the Seeds of Race and Ethnic Studies on the Farm, hosted and organized by the Stanford Historical Society. I'm Leslie Kim, and I'm Vice President of the Historical Society, as well as Co-Chair of the Program Committee. I want to extend a special thanks to those of you who are members of the Historical Society for your support, which makes these webinars and our other important historical resources possible. As all our members know, the Society is an independent, volunteer-driven organization devoted to the scholarship and sharing of Stanford history, and we rely heavily on membership dues and donations to keep our work going and to provide content such as what you'll be hearing today. Anyone who's interested can join the Society, which you can do on our website at historicalsociety.stanford.edu. Before we be begin our program, just a few practical items about this webinar. We'll start with the presentation by our featured speaker, Professor Al Camarillo. This program will include shared slides. Uh, so once the shared presentation begins, if you do not see any slides, just try changing your Zoom settings, which are usually found in the upper right corner of your screen. But if you continue to have difficulty with this or anything else involving Zoom, feel free to send a question to our staff using the Q&A button. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for questions. To submit a question at any time, just click on the Q&A button that you'll see at the bottom of your screen and type in your question, which will only be visible to our staff. We may end up grouping similar questions together and paraphrasing, so please accept our apologies in advance if we don't quote your question exactly as you've written it or if we don't have time to get to every question. For those who wish, live transcription is available during this program. You can turn this on or off by clicking on the CC or live transcription button at the bottom of your screen. Please note that this is an automated service provided courtesy of the Zoom bot, so take from it what you will in case of typos or misspelled names. And finally, this program is being recorded and will be shared as a link on our website in the coming weeks. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to turn things over to my fellow Historical Society volunteer, Noe Pablo Lozano, former Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Director of the Engineering Diversity Programs Emeritus in the School of Engineering at Stanford, who will introduce our main speaker today. Noe? Uh, thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Al Camarillo. Uh, when Al received his PhD in 1975 from UCLA, Nationally, only four Mexican-American Chicanos received a PhD in history that year. Nevertheless, uh, his dissertation was nominated as one of the best PhD theses in the nation in American history. A Stanford University history professor since 1975, Camarillo is widely regarded as one of the founding scholars and intellectuals of the field of Mexican-American history and Chicano studies. He has published seven books and dozens and dozens of articles and essays dealing with the experiences of Mexican Americans and other racial and immigrant groups in American cities. For example, Chicanos in a Change in Society from Mexican Pueblos to American Barrios and Chicanos in California, a history of Mexican Americans are seminal works. Over the course of his teaching career, Camarillo has received many awards and fellowships. He's the only Stanford university professor um, to receive six of the highest and most prestigious awards for excellence in teaching, service to undergraduate education, and contributions to the university and its alumni association. As for research and scholarship, Camarillo has received various awards, including the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship, a Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship. He was also a fellow in the center, in the Stanford Center for advanced study in the behavioral sciences and in the Stanford Humanities Center. Administratively, uh, Professor Camarillo was the Stanford Leon Slow Jr. Memorial Professor, and he was Special Assistant, Provost for Faculty Diversity, the Miriam and Peter Haas Centennial Professorship in Public Service, the Founding Director, Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies in the School of Humanities and Sciences, the Mellon Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies, the Founding Executive Director, Inter-University Program for Latino Research, and the Founding Director of the Stanford Center for Chicano Research, all at Stanford over four decades plus. Nationally, Camarillo served as President of the Organization of American Historians and is the past president of the American Historical Association, the Pacific Coast Branch. Personally, 
Al played on the UCLA championship basketball team with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, formerly known as Luau Cinder. Just as important to me though, uh, he mentored my wife, Vita, uh, while she was a Stanford teaching in this teaching program. And she went on to become an award-winning public school science, technology, engineering, mathematics teacher. And he mentored my daughter, uh, Rosina, who is now uh, doing, uh, doing, she did her Stanford history honors thesis with him. Uh, she is now a professor at Princeton University in American history, following in El Camarillo's footsteps. So you can, you know, in my house, Al walks on water. What is next for Al? <laughs> he is currently working on a book entitled Going Back to Compton, Reflections of a Native Son on Life in an Infamous American City, an autobiographical and historical account of Compton from 1950s to 2010. Look for this book. It should be uh, forthcoming in a year or so. And now, of course, for the main uh, talk and event, Professor Al Camarillo, Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, planting the seeds of race and ethnic studies on the farm. Al, it's all yours. Thank you, Noe. It's, it, it's, it's, um, thank you for the introduction. It's, it's always extra special to be introduced by an old friend, an old compañero of many decades. So thank you. And, and a special thanks to, to the, the Stanford Historical Society folks. You've heard from Leslie Kim, Michelle Morinkovich, and Charlotte Glasser are really largely responsible uh, for this program today. And there's a lot of work that goes into it. So thank you very much, appreciate it. And, and in general to the, the Stanford Historical Society for recognizing this benchmark period of 25 years and 25th year anniversary for the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. It's not only a milestone for race and ethnic studies at Stanford, but for higher education in general. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in today. Um, I know there's a lot of old friends out there. I wish I could see your faces. It's been a long, long time. But this novel coronavirus has, has an offshoot of a novel variant that's keeping us apart. But let's hope that in some time this year, that I will see many of you um, and we can celebrate. But right now we're, we have to use the technology and it's amazing technology for us to gather today. So thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, I want you to sit back, relax. Those of you that are home, go home and uh, get into your refrigerator, get a glass of wine. Mine's sitting right here. Um, so I'm going to tell you some stories about race and ethnic studies in Stanford and beyond. But before that, I'm gonna take a second here to share my slides with you. Okay. I'm gonna share some stories about uh, ethnic and race studies at Stanford that are specific to Stanford, but, but they go beyond the university. They, they are, there are some stories that, that occurred simultaneously, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes later than Stanford, but they're part of the larger history of a significant change that occurs in American higher education. Now I've spent the last, you know, <laughs> a good part of the last two years uh, reflecting on the growth, the emergence of, of race and ethnic studies, not only at Stanford, elsewhere. Uh, Noe mentioned, uh, I call it my pandemic project. It's, it's a memoir uh, going back to Compton, but embedded in it and, and intertwined in it um, are stories, my personal stories, but are stories that tell a larger story about race and ethnic studies in higher education. Now these stories, I'm, my life, my career at Stanford over 43 years uh, are intimately tied to this development of ethnic studies. I'm gonna share some of these stories with you. So the story of what we refer to as ethnic studies, ethnic studies, the interdisciplinary analyses of the history, the politics, the socioeconomic status, uh, the cultures, 
the race relations, et cetera, of people of color, the major racial and ethnic minority populations of America. The story is a complex one. I'm just going to pick and choose a few things that tell us about the origins of not only uh, CCSRE, but ethnic studies in general. Now, it, it is a story about huge segments of the American population that stood for generations outside the gates of American universities and colleges, with the exception of those fortunate African Americans that were able to enroll and graduate from the HBCUs. It, it, it's a story about racial justice. I mean, at its core, it's about racial justice. Uh, it, it, it's about communities of people seeking educational opportunities and demanding change. It's a story about prying open those gates of opportunities at colleges and universities across the land. Uh, and it starts in the immediate post-civil rights years. It's also a story about institutional change. It's a story about how colleges and universities respond to change, especially after the federal government um, establishes laws that prohibit discrimination um, based on race and national origin um, and allow underrepresented minorities as they were so-called for the first time in substantial numbers to come to higher education, to engage in college life and to educate themselves. It's also the story of how universities have to consider opening additional doors of opportunity. Uh, it, it's a story, interestingly, as well, and I, I won't say much about this, but I'll, but I'll mention a Stanford story about this, how educational leaders of these institutions, how they embrace change to make their colleges and their universities more democratic places, more inclusive universities. And on the flip side, there are a lot of stories of some educational, educational leaders that, that resisted mightily. It's a story, and you're gonna hear about some of these stories today, uh, about cohorts of students of color over time, aided by progressive white peers, and supported by faculty and, and, and staff and, and the administration as they rallied and oftentimes protests to change the curriculum and to help establish ethnic studies uh, that would grow and flourish over the next 50 years. And it's a story, and perhaps most important for me personally, I, as, I, as I reflect on this, it's an inspirational story. You know, I, I've been participant and observer, but it's an inspirational story to have seen, to have experienced this transformational impact that this curriculum of ethnic studies has had on the lives of students and the careers of students as they go forward to carve out careers in America and elsewhere. And I want to share some of that with you today. Uh, so I'm going to share those stories, a series of stories about ethnic and race studies at Stanford and beyond, and uh, to share some of those stories that are experiences for me as one as a student, as a practitioner of ethnic studies, as an administrator um, in, in different ways at the university, um, and as a historian of modern America who is always trying to make sense of this. Uh, trying to make sense of the historical legacies, how they're affecting us today as they affected us in the past. Now, some of these stories, they, they bring me joy to remember because I'm so proud of, of, of the students that went on to do amazing things and the way that an amazing institution like Stanford changed and incorporated new people into its fabric and created an, a place where people had historically been excluded are now fully in, integrated and incorporated. There's also some painful memories and you know, that's part of the story as well. So where should we start? Well, let's start appropriately with the origins 
of student activism. Because in so many ways, the origins of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity is so deeply tied to a group of students that put their careers on the line, quite frankly, to do what they did. I know these students, most of them were in my classes. I had enormous respect for these students. They were afraid. They were afraid to do what they were going to do. They greatly appreciated the opportunity to be at Stanford at a, this amazing institution. And yet there were things that deeply troubled them. They felt hurt. They were pained by what had occurred in the spring of 1994. They were afraid what they had to say to their parents that they were gonna go, they've decided to camp out in the middle of the quad and engage in a hunger strike. Why? Lots of reasons. First and foremost, it's an era in Stanford and we have many of them over time, not only at our institution, but, but across America and other institutions, a belt tightening financial tightening uh, of, of budget considerations. And it often involves elimination of positions. But in this case, there was a loss of a position that provoked an enormous uproar among the Chicano students. And then later with other students that joined their protest. In 1994, in, in a financial belt tightening of the university, the most senior Chicana administrator, Cecilia Burciaga, was let go. Cecilia was more than just an administrator, associate dean of graduate studies. She had previously been the, assist, the assistant to the president for Chicano affairs when I first came to Stanford, that was her position. She was, was a beloved resident fellow in Casa Zapata, the Chicano theme dorm. And as a Chicana, and for these Chicana students to see that they lost a person who was their model, their role model, oftentimes their inspiration. And when these students came to Stanford, Cecilia Burciaga and her family, Tony and her children that were part of this, they were the core of the community in so many ways. So they were deeply hurt, they were pained, they were outraged and mad, and they started to organize. But they were fearful and appropriately so. What were they gonna do? They took something right out of the playbook of nonviolent protest, something right out of the playbook of the United Farm Workers Movement led by Cesar Chavez, his hunger strikes, it brought enormous attention. So. It's not surprising when I look back that these students decide on a hunger strike, right? And then more students uh, are, are, are joining them. Asian American students are joining, African American students, their white peers are joining them. And others are now concerned, day one, right, of the strike, the, the day, I think it was the day before Cinco de Mayo, right? Representational um, holiday for Latino people, especially Mexican origin people. They wanted to get heard, right? They wanted to be heard. They felt aggrieved. What was it that was happening with them? I'm gonna, I'm gonna read to you a few quotes. Um, and this, this is a, a wonderful historical document that I'll share with, share with you. After the three-day hunger strike was settled, and you can see in a picture in the, in the bottom corner there that uh, President Gerhard Casper and Provost Condoleezza Rice are in the quad joining the students and settling the strike, right? But I, I want to just mention a few statements that these, these Chicanas and one male student that joined them in the hunger strike in the middle of the quad for three days. Uh, there was three days after the strike, there was an interview of these students, which I later saw and I went back to and certain things stood out for me. Let me just read these to you briefly. Um, Tamara Alvarado about a statement of the demands that they had given to the president and provost about the hunger strike. 
She said this, it is obviously a very strong statement. It's uncompromising, and it is something that shows just how serious we are about the issues. They are issues our fathers and grandfathers and other people before us fought for. And we have a responsibility to those ancestors of ours to make sure the dreams they had, the vision they had, is fulfilled. And then this is interesting here, uh, final comment here from, from Tamara. She said, it is 20 or 30 years since the Chicano movement, the Chicano Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, early 1970s, that many people think is dead, but it is not dead. We are living. We are the Chicano movement. Now, they, they use the masculine part, Chicano movement. Two, of the, two or three of the other women said, ah, Chicano movement, women? Yes, because women led the way on this strike. Julia Gonzalez Luna chimed in. She said, I know the administration is probably thinking you must be patient and, and change will happen, but we've been patient long enough. The Chicano studies major was envisioned back in the 1970s, even the 1960s. We've been waiting since then, and it's about time we get recognized. And finally, El Elvira Prieto, who, by the way, is the director of El Centro Chicano and associate dean of student affairs. Enormously proud of her. She had this to say. Whenever we had meetings with any of the administrators, we didn't get any results. It seemed to me that for them to understand how extreme the situation was on campus and how extreme things are on the outside, meaning in the larger society, especially California society at that time, the strike was maybe the only way to touch their hearts or to make them stop and think about it. Now, context, broader context, what's happening in California society and across America that's going to provoke these students to think about their place, not only the university, but, it, but in society. Those of you that are Californians that lived in the early 1990s here, you remember Governor Pete Wilson when he ran for re-election. The cornerstone of Pete Wilson's campaign was an immigrant bashing, anti-immigrant crusade, best exemplified in Proposition 187, which was passed by California citizens, very quickly deemed unconstitutional. What was it going to do? It was going to create a committee to screen immigrants in California, especially undocumented immigrants. And if you were deemed to be undocumented, you were not gonna have access to healthcare, education for your children, or anything else the state of California provides. Outrageous as we look back at it now. But this was part of the environment in which these students felt compelled to do something. By the way, Elvira added uh, a little levity to the interview. She had this when she was asked, how unusual, uh, was it for you to make plans about a hunger strike? And she said, it was not normal not to eat. She said, it just wasn't, it was abnormal for us not to eat. Now, as a, as a former resident fellow living with students in dorms, I can assure you it's really abnormal for undergraduates not to eat, but they felt compelled. And this provoked a response from Gerhard Casper and Condi Rice to do something University of Stanford included always does. Let's take your issues. Let's put them into a committee context for each. And there were many, many issues, right? There are many issues. But the one that stood out most profoundly, especially for our discussion today, if you look up in the, in, in the colored photo uh, of the, of the um, hunger strike student, hunger striking students, we want Chicano studies. That was in the foreground of the demands. And a committee was started and it took a while and it is a important starting point, but not the whole story of the creation of CCSRE. But student activism, the point being here, student activism for what they felt was right was absolutely a cornerstone. And these women and the people that supported them and all of the people that ended up coming to the, to the quad to see the settlement of the hunger strike 
They were related to these people who almost 30 years earlier, a group of students from the Black Student Union on campus, in the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. King, were compelled to do something. They too were outraged. They too were seething that the leader of the civil rights movement, this great leader in American society was assassinated. And they were also wanting to express how difficult it was for them to be students of color on a campus that had been historically predominantly white. In 1968, there were not that many students of color on the Stanford campus. And an infamous, well, I should say not if, but famous story now. You'll see at to the right of the podium, the provost, Dick Lyman, and other administrators of Stanford, they called in the, in the aftermath of the assassination of MLK Jr. They called for a forum to talk about race at Stanford. BSU students were organized. They decided we're gonna go in and we're gonna make demands and we're gonna take the mic, take back the mic, take the mic. And I'm actually, I knew Dick Lyman very well. And, and, and it was really important that they did not try to stop the students from expressing those demands. Front and center of those demands was about black studies. Many other things, the development of, uh, of a um, African-American cultural center and other things, center uh, connections with East Palo Alto's black community, other things. But their student activism was absolutely essential to get things started. I'll come back to it in a few minutes. They were part of a larger movement just up the way in the peninsula at San Francisco State University. The origins of ethnic studies as we know them in the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st century were born there in San Francisco State University in what's called the Third World Liberation Front Strike. They too were saying, we want to be a part of this institution. We want to feel like we belong. And you have to understand the larger context again of, the, of, of what's happening in American society. It's a tumultuous era in American history in the late 1960s. Um, we're living through one again. That's a different story. This was a time so you see the students marching at San Francisco State. They are the very first cohort of African-American and Latino and, and uh, Asian-American and Native American students to be on this campus. Now, it's not to say there weren't some students of color uh, that had enrolled in, in San Francisco State and other places, including Stanford before, but they were small in number, right? They felt the institution wasn't listening to them, wasn't responding to them. And they were calling for greater inclusion, really, right? For reform, for change. And part of that change was ethnic studies. Now, I'll just give you an example of how this really was the first time students of color come together uh, to argue um, and to protest to be included. Personal example, I started UCLA pre-affirmative action days in 1966, a long time ago. Um, the largest public university in the state of California. And when I started there, there were 44 Mexican-Americans and 100 African-Americans. Most of them, of the, of the black students, and I knew many of them, were athletes. By 1968, that had changed. There were hundreds and hundreds more students that come in under affirmative action. The first time that students of color in substantially large cohorts are now admitted to colleges and universities across the United States. Interesting, and I wanna point out what's argued for and what happens, and by the way, there was enormous resistance at San Francisco State, bloody resistance. But in the end, there was change and a unique, and the unique development of ethnic studies, in fact, the only college of ethnic studies created back in 1968, still the only college of ethnic studies that I know of in higher education. But across the Bay, another third world liberation front 
was taking hold at UC Berkeley, 1969. Likewise, students were following in the path of those from San Francisco State. They knew it was happening. It happened at Stanford. They knew it was happening across uh, colleges and universities uh, in, in the United States. And, and one of the, of course, the, not surprising, one of the key demands was the development of ethnic studies. Now at Berkeley, that resulted in a department of ethnic studies, a department of ethnic studies that had four programs of four components, Asian American, Native American, Chicano, uh, and African American. So we're seeing across America, the emergence for the first time of ethnic studies in an organized way. And it's born out of student activism, but in collaboration with leaders of institutions that see this is the right thing to do. This is something they must do as their universities are changing and they're grappling with those changes. Now, let's go back to Stanford. So the BSU and the, the people that supported them said, okay, let's, create a committee to, again, a committee, that's the way we operate. Let's create a committee to determine whether we can actually launch, develop and launch a program in African American studies. And it fell to an amazing man, Jim Gibbs, professor of anthropology who'd been brought to Stanford earlier in the decade in the 1960s and was appointed as the first Dean of undergraduate studies. He was a mentor to so many of us. I mean, he's a hero for me. Uh, a, a scholar of the, of, of the first order, an active citizen of the university and someone who was committed to changing the university. So Jim becomes the, he, he shepherds through the protocol of the university, uh, which has many steps uh, to get a program in African-American studies launch, launch. By the way, the first program in black studies at a private university anywhere in America. So very important. He somehow persuaded and was able to lure to Stanford, the great Sinclair Drake, one of the great pioneers of, of African-American studies, um, amazing, amazing sociologist uh, on, on the black urban experience. And he becomes the first director of the first regular director of AAAS. And you know, it, it's not easy to develop a program, especially when you don't have many faculty that are experts in ethnic studies, African-American studies in general. But that will change in time, but slowly. Other places are changing. And I, I'll take you back now to, to where I went. I was a student. I mentioned that I start, started in 1966. And the place began to change. We too were arguing for inclusion for ethnic studies. But at UCLA, and here's the example I want to make of UCLA, you had the youngest chancellor ever appointed at a University of California um, university at that time, Charles Young. And he said, look, we need to do something. Let's make it the core of the university of what we do about research, the intellectual mission of the, re of the research mission of the university. So at UCLA, when I was a student there, it wasn't a development of or institutionalization of uh, curricular programs, but research centers organized under what was called then uh, and celebrated its 50 year anniversary a few years ago, the Institute of American Cultures, which had what, what the University of California system calls organized research units in Asian American, Black, Chicano, and Native American studies. And that was very important and yet a different model for ethnic studies. Now you'll notice in the photo here, this tall guy, many of you know who he is, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, a year ahead of me at UCLA. And he's stand, standing there with, with Ralph Bunch and, 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 and his spouse in front of at that time in 1969, they named that building behind him or them, the Ralph, Ralph Bunch Hall. And just next to it was Campbell Hall, the place that housed the organized research units in ethnic studies. Now, that big tall guy, when he was at UCLA, his name was Lou Alcindor. 
we called him Big Lou, and I, I shared the basketball court with that, that guy uh, when, when I was a, a freshman at, at UCLA. And I should tell you, uh, I t- Kareem Abdul-Jabbar took one, this is, a, this is a footnote, but I'll add it. Um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, an amazing star in the NBA and in college, right? Uh, one of a kind. He only took but made one three-pointer in his NBA career. I taught Kareem Abdul-Jabbar how to shoot that shot, but that's a different story, which I, I will not tell here. All right, little personal note here. That classroom that you see in the bottom of that screen was like the classroom that I sat in in 1969 to take a course, the first Chicano history course ever offered in the University of California system, taught by Juan Gomez Quinones, who I thought was an assistant professor, I later learned very quickly, he was a graduate student in the UCLA Department of History. He became my friend, my mentor, my colleague for four generations. He recently passed away. He was an amazing pioneer. I sat spellbound in that classroom, hearing for the first time stories, history about Mexican Americans, about Chicanos that I had never been exposed to before. I had been struggling at UCLA. Coming from the Compton Unified School District, I was way behind most of my peers at UCLA, at this great university. But when I took that Chicano history class, when I took the next quarter, the first African-American history class ever offered at UCLA, and then I took a, a course on the history of racial attitudes America in America, that intellectual light went on. I became motivated. I became a good student, maybe even an outstanding student by the time I graduated, at least enough for the UCLA Department of History to say, stay here, let's get you into the PhD program. And it's there where we really start Chicano history. Juan Gomez Quinones is the pioneer. Back on the farm. So uh, I come there in 1975, not even with a PhD in hand. This was true for a lot of us back then. Universities were scrambling, as was Stanford, to hire the first cohort of faculty of color. And I was part of that cohort. And when I came, the landscape of ethnic studies and cultural centers and theme dorms at Stanford was in its infancy. Now, we had the program in African and African and African American studies, and it was ongoing. And, but it was continuing to be a struggle to offer the core curriculum. There were still so few specialists in African American studies, but it was reaching students and it was impacting lives. There was a quasi Chicano studies program, but it wasn't that. It was called the Chicano Fellows Program, started in 1971. And, those of us, I, I was the second faculty member brought to, uh, a Chicano faculty member brought to Stanford who was a specialist in Chicano studies. I was a specialist in Mexican American history. And so those of us that we were teaching our courses, but this program was for advanced graduate students. The university decided that its response to Chicano studies early on would be, let's, we don't have enough faculty, we'll try to hire more. But let's get some advanced graduate students. There weren't many of them, but there were some, and many of them were focusing on Chicano and Chicano issues. Let's get them uh, fellowships and have them teach one or two courses. And for 20 years plus, the Chicano fellow, Fellows Program was an important part of the curriculum in Chicano studies. And then in 1980, I'll give you a little background here so you can position what happens in 1996 with the formation of the Center for Comparative Studies of Race and Ethnicity. In 1980, there's a few more Chicano faculty. I think there are 10 of us in, in 1980 at, at Stanford. We go to the provost, Don Kennedy at the time, soon to be present, president the next year, with a proposal that we need a, a, an institutional foothold for Chicano studies, for Chicano research at Stanford. He agreed. He was one of those progressive edu- uh, leaders of higher education that said, this is the right thing to do. This is what Stanford needs to do. We need to change. And he agreed to create 
the Stanford Center for Chicano Research. And like the program in African and African American Studies, which was the first program of, of, of Black studies in a private university anywhere in America, the Stanford Center for Chicano Research uh, was the first center of its kind at a private university in the country. Um, I had the good fortune of being the, the uh, first director of that center. But I also want to position you to that other part of the slide under cultural centers and theme residences. So there were courses being taught in the 70s, 80s at, at, at Stanford, but there were also other hubs of education going on, ethnic studies education, cultural education, the Black Community Service Center, known as the Black, Black House, uh, was an important place where ethnic studies in a cultural way, sometimes they brought faculty in to meet with the students. This was part of the larger ambience or the larger context of ethnic studies at Stanford, as was El Centro Chicano, which an Asian American activity center, the Native American Cultural Center, within a span of 10 years, you have all those centers. By the way, I'm glad that we ended up calling El Centro Chicano that name. I remember vividly in the basement of the Nidery, the old union, I was one of the faculty members involved in the committee to make the proposal to the Dean uh, of, 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 um, uh, of Student Affairs and to the provost, to the university to create this cultural, Chicano cultural uh, community. And I remember <laughs> very vividly, and you can see the smile on my face, we were getting to the point, what are we gonna call this place? And there was this, I, this, this graduate student, Chicano graduate student, funny guy, I remember. I, I think he was in modern thought and literature. And he comes up with the name and something like um, Centro Acción Chicanos de Atlan. And I thought about it, I said, you know, what? that's kind of a provocative name. But then immediately I thought, wait a minute, the acronym is CACA. So I stopped him in his tracks. I said, look, man, when your parents come to Stanford, and they're walking around, they're gonna to come to the, the Chicano Cultural Center. Are they gonna see that acronym CACA? Uh-uh, ain't gonna happen. We agreed on El Centro Chicano. I should also mention another hub, an important hub for ethnic studies, cultural activities, educational activities were in the theme dorms, Ujima House, Casa Zapata, Okada House, Mawekma Taura, these were, important places um, and still are very much so. Sometimes contested, but very much part of the fabric of race and ethnicity at Stanford historically and today. Okay, I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but I do, it, it is foreground to what happens with the establishment of the center. Oh, I was worried. I was worried because in 1984 and 1985 and 1986, I was hearing about and reading about racial tensions flaring up on college and university campus across the United States. And I worried, damn, are we gonna be the next university to encounter something like this? I knew there was a possibility because microaggressions and, and there was a lot of racism going on. You know, most people didn't realize it. I was close to so many of these students. I knew about it. And I knew a lot more about it within a couple of years after what happened. You see that, that poster that was discovered in the spring of 1987 on a, on a bulletin board in Ujima House. Someone had taken the, the photo or the picture of Beethoven and turned it into a caricature, a racist caricature of an African-American. Someone found out the next morning and they kept it under wraps for a while until a few days later, there was another poster and it had the N-word scratched across it. Things blew up, it got, up, it got out. People were outraged. Racial tension had come to Stanford big time. Students mobilized. The Black Student Union was at the core of it, but they brought other students with them. They formed a rainbow coalition. The students in the center of that slide, Asian-American, African-American, Latina, 
and others, Native Americans and white students support them. They occupy Don Kennedy's office peacefully and they demand some type of commission, some type of assessment of race issues, race, the race context on the Stanford campus. Don agreed. He knew he had, he, he knew the university had to do this. I got a call early after the autumn quarter started in 1987 from the secretary uh, in Don's office. Um, Professor Camarillo, um, the president and provost would like to meet with you as soon as possible. Now, that scared me a little bit. I said to myself, damn, what does the president and provost, they've never called me in together. I've met with them individually. I've never talked with them together. What do they want? What do they want? Did I get into some trouble? No. They had decided to form a very ambitious university committee on minority issues. And for the next 18 months, a huge committee, 20 plus people, we engaged in, a, in an assessment of what was happening at Stanford. Um, and it was the first time the university had really gotten serious about analyzing what were the issues that were driving the tension? How do we ameliorate those tensions? What do we have to do to make this institution a better institution, a more inclusive institution, so that we can become, as you see in the title of this report that we issued, building a multiracial, multicultural, and I should say interactive, multiracial, multicultural university committee. What came of that? report. Well, it took, it took a long time coming, but we got it out. There were over 100 recommendations all over the place, many, many things. And much, really, with, with enormous pride, I say this, Don Kennedy said, we're going to incorporate so many of these recommendations. We're going we're gonna to think about them. We're going to assess them. And where we can, we're going to incorporate them. That changes the ball game at Stanford for race and ethnic studies and racial tensions. Of course, many of them dealt with student affairs, increasing funding to ethnic centers, creating new position in multicultural affairs. But what I wanna mention here, because it's really important and you can't explain the origins of CCSRE without understanding that Don Kennedy and then later Gerhard Casper and Condoleezza Rice basically give notice to D. Ewart Thomas of h &S and John Chauvin, two people who were fully embracing the changes. By the way, 75 of those 100 recommendations were instituted at the university within 12 months. That's amazing. But the more important thing was, and the most difficult thing was, to appoint new faculty so that one of the cornerstones of that report was, we have to develop further the curriculum and ethnic studies at Stanford for all of our students, not just students of color, all of our students. And importantly, I think the UCMI report and all of the discussions, hundreds of discussions that went on among faculty and staff and students, um, uh, that there was a renewed commitment to what later becomes, and we know now, as diversity. All right, that's some of the context. Ewart Thomas went out and started hiring people, and John Chauvin, after him, started hiring people, and there were several other deans across the university that took the cue with support from the university administration to try to find as many faculty of color, especially those who could contribute to the expansion of ethnic studies. And that's gonna lay a very important foundation for the center's founding. Now you'll see photos, these are a lot of my old friends. These are some of the people that were there from the beginning, there, there are many others. There's some of these folks no longer with us, George Fredrickson, Dr. Dorothy Steele, and some of these other people are, are in the thick of it now still working at this, uh, at this project. To, uh, to make Stanford a better institution. Now you notice in the announcement, if you read it carefully, I, I often refer to the establishment 
of CCSRE is Ethnic Studies 2.2. Why? There had been a generation and a half of ethnic studies scholarship and curriculum development across higher education. It was rich, it was flowering. There were more, there were now no longer a few graduate students in programs across higher education. There were hundreds of graduate students that were the next generation promoting ethnic studies. So it was expanding, it was getting richer, richer, it was getting deeper. But we took advantage of all that. Now, interesting. You note that the title is the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. The students in 1994 and 1995, when we started the committees to determine how we were going to uh, create at least the undergraduate teaching program, uh-uh, they did not want comparative studies. They wanted their freestanding ethnic programs in Asian American, in Chicano and Chicano studies, in Native American studies. But the faculty, because we were the ones that knew we would be the ones administering and developing the, the, the curriculum and sustaining the curriculum that we wanted comparative approaches. We had already been the faculty, some of the men, all those people, the faces you saw on the previous slide, we had been involved in a project about comparative race and ethnicity. John Chauvin had given me by that time, and I was an associate dean uh, working with first year Thomas and, and John Chauvin, and then uh, the, the dean of undergraduate studies. He gave me carte blanche to think about how ethnic studies should be organized at Stanford. And this was before, this was in 1992 and 1993. And George Fredrickson, may he rest in peace, one of the great comparative historians uh, of his generation, close colleague of mine, friend in, in history. Um, we decided to put together with the support of John Chauvin, h and and the university, um, to make a proposal to the Mellon, Andrew uh, Mellon Foundation for a seminar, and we called it Comparative Studies of Race and Ethnicity. We brought for the first time groups of faculty that were doing ethnic specific studies in their particular group, Native American, Asian American, Latino, Chicano, uh, et cetera, into a context where we began to see the enormous payoff of beginning to analyze and compare the realities, historical contemporary realities of groups across group. And not only within the United States, but across the United States. So comparative became the approach. No other center, no other ethnic studies center had put in the, in, in, in the foreground of their work, the comparative approach. That was different. That was important. It's interdisciplinary, it's multidisciplinary. We can call it transdisciplinary. Some people call it cross-disciplinary. We got, because we were able because of the comparative approach, domestic, international, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, more and more faculty began to come into the context of this center. We started out with relatively few, 40, about 40, 35, 40 in 1996 when the center got off the ground. It's over 150 faculty across almost all schools at the university today. We also decided that we were going to meld, and here's where one of the distinctions that, that, that I think has an impact in higher education uh, as, as we begin to launch our work at CCSRE. We're going to meld teaching the curriculum with research. So we decided it wasn't going to be a curricular program in comparative studies. It was going to be a center with one huge part of it, the curricular programs, the degree granting programs in Chicano studies, Native American, Asian American studies, and Jewish studies, which no other ethnic studies program in the nation had considered. We were doing something different, something profoundly important, and it caught on. And we brought in because there was a, uh, the history of AAAS of African American studies. They became part of the umbrella, but the autonomy remained for AAAS. So we melded the research, 
the training of graduate students, the training of undergraduate res research, we put that together under one roof. And we did it knowing that we, it is a fundamental commitment to racial justice. And that's one of the amazing things about ethnic studies that separated it from traditional academic studies in higher education, because fundamentally at the core of it was not only the development of knowledge, the intellectual mission of expanding understanding about diversity in our society and societies around the world, it was about racial justice at our university, at our universities. And it was about a community engagement and outreach. We wanted to build a center that had connections to communities. And again, this was, a, this was one of the hallmarks, uh, hallmarks of ethnic studies. So today, the mission statement, advance the racial equity through interdisciplinary education, innovative research, and community engagement. Now, I've given you some stories that it's just sketchy stories, right? Tells a little bit about the formation of CCSRE. Uh, but because of the anniversary celebration, there, the center staff developed this really excellent commemorative book. I provide here, and you can get it elsewhere if you go on the website for CCSRE, uh, the, the commemorative book, which is, really provides an excellent overview, way more than I did today. Um, so I, I suggest that you, you, uh, you go to that, that book. All right, let me end on this. It was March 2019, pre-pandemic. We measure everything by post, uh, pre-pandemic, during the pandemic. This was pre-pandemic when I didn't actually have to wear a mask. I sat there before the California State Assembly Education Committee thinking about ethnic studies. 50 years of ethnic studies. I was sitting next to Assemblyman Jose Medina, who was leading the most recent charge of a 20 year history to get an ethnic studies requirement passed by the state legislature, by the assembly and then the Senate. And it corresponded with an earlier achievement by the woman you see there as well, um, Shirley Weber, now the Secretary of State of California, but at the time Assemblywoman from San Diego, she led the charge to create an ethnic studies requirement in all of the California State University system uh, campuses. But there I was that day thinking about how could have I imagined when I was a student at UCLA, a graduate student at UCLA, starting my career, at Stanford in 1975, that we could be at a point where it was possible that ethnic studies could be a part of every California child's education. And it was, and it is. Assembly Bill 101 was signed into law by, the, by Governor Newsom in October. And ethnic studies beginning in 2025 will be a requirement for every high school student before he or she graduates. That's change. That's institutional change. That's societal change. Every, this photo of these children, every child now in California will be exposed to ethnic studies. And I argue when I argued decades ago, as I argue now, it'll make them better citizens of the state, of the nation, It'll make them more educated citizens in our diverse society. And it'll make our society a better place. Now, I have a particular affinity to these, this group of multiracial children because they're my, our six grandchildren. Um, but they are going to be part of that generation, of that next generation that will have access to the transformative power of ethnic studies. So I'm going to end here, and I'm going to get out of um, the slides so we can start our q and I went a little longer than I thought, which is always the case. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Al. Thank you for that wonderful presentation.
um, for your incredible perspective. And really, thank you for your pioneering work um, that you've done in this field. I think a lot of people in the audience um, uh, have been influenced by you. Um, we're seeing some of the comments and questions that are coming in through Q&A, uh, which we will now get to. And, and Noe will go ahead and uh, moderate the Q&A and ask some of the questions from the audience. If you didn't get a chance, you can submit a question at any time. Just use that little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Okay. Well, so um, leading you into this, um, so how do you assess the progress in faculty diversity at Stanford uh, since you chaired the UCMI study back in uh, 8487? You know, that's, a, that's an excellent question, Noe, because it, it, it has the, been the most difficult part of change at not only at Stanford, but, but at other universities. Um, there has been substantial change. The numbers are still relatively small. Um, there's, there's good reason why, why uh, the process, uh, Provost Dr uh, Drell and, 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 and our president and, and deans and others are making yet another effort, redoubling efforts to identify, recruit and hire at the department school level, more faculty of color but it is the most difficult thing to change at a university. Don Kennedy set the stage though. One of the amazing things that he agreed to right away, very early after the, the UCMI report was issued, was a commitment to hire 30 new faculty of color over the next several years. I think it was five or 10 years. That was unprecedented. Um, but it led, it, it paved the way, as I mentioned earlier, the message and the commitment of resources that went to some of the deans, your Thomas, uh, John Chauvin, other deans after another, and deans of schools elsewhere at the university to start getting really serious, redoubling efforts to reach out, to expand the searches, to recruit those faculty of color. Uh, and there has been progress, but it's been slow, um, frustratingly so, right? I was involved in that the last eight years of my career at Stanford as the assistant provost, uh, assistant to the provost for, for faculty development. And, and we made progress and I know it will change. And what's happening now uh, with the new initiatives at the provost uh, in, in consort with the board of trustees and the deans and with the possibility, I think we're gonna hear sometime this next year about the creation of a new institute in race and ethnic studies, um, that there'll be another big push to uh, augment the number of faculty of color at Stanford. A more specific question, has anyone completed a study of Latinos and Chicanos who attended Stanford during its early years? And you know, who were the first Chicano Latino graduates of Stanford? And are there Californios in early Mexican American history that connected to Stanford that should be honored? I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to plug a book that will be out, I think, later this month, uh, written by one of our distinguished alums, Frank Sotomayor, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from the Los Angeles Times, who decided uh, um, a couple years ago, I think, it was his pandemic project to write the history of Chicanos at Stanford. And it will be published later this year, uh, later this month. Um, and so look for it. Go on, go on Amazon, uh, Frank Sotomayor. Uh, I'm sure that the CCSRE will put something in its announcement, but this is the first and really only study um, history of Chicanos, uh, Latinos at Stanford. So it's, it's a good read. It's an excellent read. And so it's a real, uh, it's a real contribution that Frank has made. All right. Following question. I think many members of the campus community see these committees as a way to appease students long enough for the issues to die down again. But the rapid implementation of the items from the UCMI report is unusual, um, if encouraging. What do you recommend to students who are in, in the struggle today, who often feel that change won't happen in their time at the university? You know, Noe, that, that, that's the same question that we were struggling with 50 years ago, it doesn't go away, right? 
racial justice has not been achieved in this society. We've come significant, you know, that we've made significant strides in higher education, you know, and higher education institutions are unique in American society because of the place the institutions that have changed. They've changed perhaps more than any other institutions in our society. But the struggle continues. We are in the midst of yet another, some people call it a racial reckoning. It's another part of the history, the evolution of racial justice issues in our society. They're not going away. It's intergenerational. And if, if there are students that are chiming in on this, it's intergenerational. I came here because people before me argued that change had to occur. And people before them were arguing for basic civil rights of people that had been treated so unfairly, so unjustly, kept out of the center of American society. So it's intergenerational. And I argue these days, especially, we cannot be complacent. No one, no American can be complacent. That this struggle for racial justice, whether it be at Stanford for additional faculty or for resources for graduate students or whatever it might be, is part of a responsibility. Tamara Alvarado, Alvarado said it right when I quoted her, her ancestors, right? So it is a cumulative process. Change will occur. It, it will occur, although we're at a, a, at a fork in the road right now where I have to tell you, different story, but maybe there'll be a Stanford Historical Society uh, a webinar about this in the future. Where are we gonna go with race in America? it's not clear where we're going to go. The legacies of the past haunt us, right? They haunt us today. And we see the manifestation of them. But change only occurs when people are willing to drop that complacency, be agents of change, commit to something that's important for them. And if it's a student, commit to being a good student. First of all, if they're at Stanford, it's an amazing university with so many opportunities. But use that opportunity, not only to advance yourself and advance your family, to advance your community, to advance your society. Change only occurs when we become active and articulate the things that are important to us. Great. Uh, talking about change, uh, using a metric, um, how many students major in ethnic studies at Stanford in each graduating class do you feel there should be more given the faculty resources devoted to CCRE? Um, you know, I don't know the numbers right now. Um, when we started uh, the CSRE program, undergraduate program in 96, we started out with 10 students. Um, it was the fastest growing major at Stanford for the first 10 years. After six years, we had 125 students. Um, I think the number, I'm not sure about the numbers you can go on, on, on the center's website. It's, it's in the hundreds, it, it's, it's 120, 100, I'm not sure. Uh, right. But more importantly, um, or just as importantly, these ethnic studies courses are reaching literally thousands and thousands of students every year. That is a, that is a sea change from 25 years ago, certainly from 45 years ago when I started here. And that's important because ethnic studies is not just for students of color. It's for all of our students. It's for all of us, right? And that is a measure, now a metric of having that many courses in which Stanford undergraduates, irrespective of race and ethnicity, are taking these courses. That is a hugely important metric. Okay. Um, very, very specific question to El Centro. Um, Students said, I was part of the first guiding concilio designed to provide Stanford the institution, uh, institutional suggestions on how to make progress on def, uh, diversifying the curriculum and the faculty. Whatever happened to the guiding concilio? Uh, you know, I think, I think there is still um, an advisory group. Uh, it, it originally was called the guiding concilio, an advisory group. And I do believe that, that there still is a, uh, an advisory committee or group that of students and staff and faculty that um, that provide input to uh, Elvira Pieto and the and the staff of El Centro Chicano. Right. 
Um, you've answered some of this, but I, th I think there's, you know, uh, um, there's a little bit of need from uh, this person on the clarification. Could you explain a little bit more about the comparative in the Center for Comparative Studies and Race and Ethnicity? And does it have any relation to fellow historian George Fredrickson's comparative historical work? Is this still relevant today? And how is it applied to CCRE's activities? You know, it's still it's still enormously important. Uh, George, of course, was one of the, the preeminent historians of comparative history, um, and, and he and I, a, a little a little more background, just just a few just a minute about background. Out of the UCMI um, report and recommendation was to develop as quickly as we could uh, additional curricula in comparative in, in, in race and ethnicity. Uh, George and I happened to be on the uh, faculty advisory committee of the program of American studies. And it was the only place on campus where there were some courses uh, kind of organized loosely under the rubric of the program in American studies. George and I, because I was increasingly influenced by George and his comparative approach, as I was doing my own work, on comparing the, the, the histories, the urban histories of African-Americans and European immigrants uh, and, and, uh, and, and Latinos, Puerto Ricans, Japanese Americans. So I was continually enthralled and intellectually inspired by this a comparative approach because George and others, and there were many others, others of us that I mentioned in the seminar supported by the Mellon Foundation that saw the ability when you, you could transcend the history of one group and see how it was mirrored in the other, in some other group, or maybe it was distinctly unique, but those comparisons allowed us to flesh things out, to understand historic dynamics more. How did, how did the, how did the, the for example, the black freedom struggle in the South, how did it resonate with Asian Americans, Native Americans and Chicanos and other parts of the, of, of the country in the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s? Only by doing a comparative analysis can you get at one, the similarities as well as the differences. And then the larger one, which the center, and I have to admit, I'm partly to blame for this, didn't promote enough international, that is, comparisons of US society to other societies around the world. But when you start making those comparisons as George Fredrickson did, he compared South African apartheid to, um, to black suppression in the South, to oppression in the South um, for African-Americans. And so we saw the, how it could, it could in, it really inform, uh, educate us. We were, as faculty, we were educating ourselves. So it's profoundly important, we thought, now that we have this huge literature of ethnic studies after 40 years in the academy, let's take stock of it. Let's, let's start comparing these groups. Uh, and by the way, I should mention, it caught fire. 12 universities and colleges within the next 10 years modeled their ethnic studies, race and ethnic studies programs on CCSRE, comparative, domestic, international, multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. So we thought we were onto something, right? We, were thought, we were thought we were developing something uniquely important for the evolution of ethnic studies. And it was, it was. And so they often call it the Stanford model now, comparative approach. And you know, we take good, great pride in that. So, uh... What is A101, of course? Uh, many have praised this course. Does that sound familiar to you, that course? I, I'm sorry, can you repeat that, Noe? Uh, what repeat. is, oh, course, uh, it's a course question. And they want to know, what, um, what is course AB101? Uh, many have praised this course. Um, it, it may be in reference to the CSRE core course. Um, okay. If it is, it was one of the products of our early faculty discussions in that seminar. Um, George Fredrickson and I developed a core course for American Studies program 
1994, I think it was called Introduction to uh, Race and Ethnicity in the American Experience. And when the, when the Comparative Studies and Race and Ethnicity program started in 96, it became the core course among many courses that were developed for the majors in CSRE. I, th I think that's the course uh, that's being referenced. Okay, very good. Uh, somebody answered the questions about the metric. I think it's been 40 degrees, 40 bachelor's degrees that are awarded in ethnic studies in 2018, 19, and 2020. Just, just I'll get some metric. Okay, um, CCRE reference to race and ethnicity. How do you define these two terms? What are the differences as well as the similarities between them? Ooh, <laughs> that, is, that is a question that um, we have been talking about for 50 years. It's such a critical question. Um, it, they're categories, right? They're, they're categories. And we can look back historically to see how those categories 100 years, years ago were framed in such racist ways, right? About category, categorizing people on their intelligence levels, uh, their level of civilization. But when we started to develop race and ethnic studies, we were still adhered in a way, unfortunately, to some of those categories. The major populations of ethnic groups, national origin groups, racial minorities, historically defined, right? They're still historically defined as communities of color, racial minorities in the United States. But those categories are not static. They're, they're inventions in a way, right? They are inventions and they have to be critically analyzed and they're fluid, they're fluid. And we have to be critical about the way we use them. So that's, a, but, but the, the larger and much longer response to that is course 101A. Uh, that talks about all this. So if, if you're a student, enroll in that course. Very good. So how does the CCRE grapple with the experiences of immigrants of color and their children who may be Stanford students? For example, among Latinos, the Salvadorian and the Guatemaltecos refugees of the 1980s and after, et cetera. Yeah, good question, because in my comment, that final comment about things have to be fluid in terms of ethnicity. So 40 years ago, we could talk about Chicanos at Stanford. You can't just say Chicanos at Stanford as that group. It's Chicanos and Latinos or Mexican-Americans, Hispanic origin people, right? There's a transformation at Stanford and at California Society and American Society in general, for all these groups, right? There has been enormous immigration. And for Latino folks in a state like California, beginning in the 80s and in the 90s and into the 21st century, they constitute an ever-growing proportion of Latino population and Latino students at Stanford. So a few years ago, what started out as El Centro Chicano is now El Centro Chicano E and Latino. So it's a reflection of that expansion of a category that was at one time appropriate. So for example, when I started Stanford, probably 98% of all um, Hispanic origin students at Stanford were Mexican origin. That's not the case anymore. So there's change over time. And it's true of, of, of other immigrants. Um, Caribbean immigration into African-American communities, um, other immigrants coming that are changing the fabric of what we call race and ethnicity in, in, um, in America, in the state of California, and in our curriculum at Stanford. Okay, so a couple more questions. Do the programs lose something by not including, if only for historical reasons, lessons from previous oppressed communities, Irish, Italians, Polish. Certainly there are some lessons and comparisons that could profitably be um, included. Unquestionable. The comparative approach allows for that. Um, 
The fact that we uh, institutionally, when we created the center to incorporate Jewish studies, you cannot talk about ethnic and racial, racialized oppression, unless you talk about the history of Jews in America and elsewhere, right? You can't understand properly Asian American immigration to the United States unless you understand in a comparative approach, what was happening at the same time for Irish Americans who were coming to New York City or to Philadelphia or Chicago in the 1860s and 1870s. These kinds of comparisons are not limited to the four major groups. I mean, they still constitute the core of ethnic studies historically and today, but the comparative approach and ethnic studies in general incorporates these experience because they give us additional, I think they give us additional insight into these dynamics that we call race and eth ethnicity in the United States and elsewhere. So absolutely you incorporate and consider those analyses across between groups. Okay, so you described CCSRE um, as an ethnic studies 2.0. What do you see the next evolution of ethnic and race studies at Stanford, the 3.0 version? And how is the university working towards that version? That is a really good question. I am not the person to respond <laughs> to that. <laughs> I've been retired for a few years. I know that some, uh, some things are happening at the university. Um, that portend a significant jump, a significant elevation of research, teaching, policy analysis, and, and that will change the landscape, I think, and this is, again, I don't know the details about this, I think will change the landscape of race and ethnic studies at Stanford and higher education. So stay tuned. Uh, I'm sure the provost will have something to say about this in the months ahead. Uh, and a committee that she formed will, will obviously uh, talk about this. And I'm eager, I'm eager to find out what is going to be Ethnic Studies 3.0. So stay tuned. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna get uh, one last question. To an audience of alumni who graduated 25 or more years ago, before CCSRE, what kind of literature, podcasts, or videos do you recommend for deeper learning on the subject of comparative ethnic studies? I think there, there are many opportunities, um, continuing studies at Stanford. Uh, I'm sure the future will, will uh, offer courses that will get at these topics. I think, alums that come back for a reunion weekend, there'll be more opportunities for them to partake of this. Um, I think there, there will be multiple ways online learning for them to engage in, in reading and, and learning more about, um, about th this curriculum, this literature uh, in higher education. So if one starts looking, um, it's gonna be there. And by the way, because of this new law, this new state law mandating ethnic studies in, um, for graduation of all California high school students, there's gonna be a huge proliferation of literature and online material. I hope that all citizens, whether you're California or not, whether you're alumni of Stanford or not, will have access to. So I think you're gonna see a, a mushrooming of, of information that people can access. But let me on that note, thank, thank you all for joining in. This was, this was fun for me to do. It's part of my reflections. It's a part of an amazing story at an amazing institution. And, and a part of our history that um, both continues to inspire me and also make me want to work harder and harder, even in my old age. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Professor Camarillo. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, thank you to Al on behalf of the Stanford Historical Society. Uh, thank you for taking the time to give us all of this fascinating history.
And thank you, Noe, um, for moderating the Q&A um, and passing on the questions of our audience. Thank you to our audience for your excellent questions and for joining us today. Next month, we do invite you to join us for another webinar that we have planned. Um, this one will take place on February 16th, and it's entitled Road to Roses, John Ralston and Black Football Players at Stanford. We have a fantastic group of alumni, uh, including Albert Win Wilburn, Gene Washington, and Hillary Shockley, who will share the their stories of being recruited by and playing for Stanford football in the 1960s and 70s. So that should be a fascinating evening. Again, to all our members, your continued support makes what we do possible. We're incredibly grateful. If you're not a member of the Historical Society and would like to join, we are open to everyone. Um, or if you'd simply like to make a donation to help us with our programs and activities, we appreciate that too. We'll post information at the conclusion of this program, or you can simply go to our website, historicalsociety.stanford.edu. There you'll also find links to a lot of online resources such as oral histories, recordings of past programs, digital issues of our quarterly sandstone and tile publication and details on upcoming programs. We'll send out a survey by email in the coming days and we welcome any feedback or comments you may have about this program or ideas for future topics on Stanford history that may appeal to you. Thank you all again for joining us and we wish you a very pleasant rest of your evening. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Be well.